because of science media, I can take a higher ground and say I'm a scientist and I'm in the media, so therefore we're not going to publish anything like that. But the point is, especially online media, you have to drive traffic to these articles. And yep. often, you know, the and especially tabloid press, they don't care about science. They'll say, oh, Earth's been discovered. And it may be a uh, super Earth orbiting outside the habitable zone. They don't care. I mean, the point is it brings people in. And then they might explain a little bit of science if you're lucky. Uh, with science media, we have to be a lot more careful because, uh, you know, ultimately we have to be accurate. And so I occasionally perhaps one or two articles will slip by when I see that the author, the writer of the article has used Earth-like to mean a wildly different kind of world that is nothing Earth-like, Earth-like, so I have to go in and edit it. But that's purely because you know, science media is like that. But whereas tabloid media, they they wouldn't care. We, we've got other means of driving traffic, and you know, inaccurate headlines isn't one of them. <laughs> Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, cool. Well, so Nancy, uh, you've got a story about how... Oh, can you mute your mic again, Ian? You've got mm. a bit of an echo there. Um, so Nancy, you've got a story this week on University Day about how uh, Mars soil could be sucking up water from the atmosphere. Yeah, there were some geologists that were uh, working down in, in Antarctica in the McMurdo Dry Valley area, which is a, a cold polar desert, and they were finding areas of moist patches of soil even though there wasn't any snow melt there and and there wasn't any rain recently so what they found was that um, kind of salty soils in the region where they were at actually sucks moisture out of the atmosphere and this is kind of reminiscent of what happens in the summertime in in the uh, when it's humid and the salt in your salt shaker kind of clumps up because it just basically kind of sucks the water vapor out of the air um, but the thing is, with regular table salt, you'd need to have about 75% humidity to make it work. But with the uh, with the kind of things that they found in the soil in Antarctica, like calcium chloride, it would only have to be about 35% humidity. And and even on a really cold day, they found that this was taking place. And they were finding it like everywhere because there are salts in the soils um, pretty much everywhere. They're along streams and and uh, in soils everywhere, and even under the glaciers. Now, the interesting thing here is that back in 2009, a paper came out from the Mars Phoenix team, and, and the similarities here are really kind of striking. Um, the salty, uh, remember they found perchlorates in the soil there, and the, those are actually salty as well. And um, uh, in, in their paper back in 2009, uh, Peter Smith and his team said that um, they thought that the, the perchlorates in the, in the soil there were attracting water, even though that um, in the samples that they put into Phoenix's uh, little bake oven that it had, uh, they found that it makes up just a few tenths of a percent of the composition uh, of the samples that they looked at. But um, at higher concentrations, they thought that it might combine with the water vapor that it sucked out of the air and, uh, and actually create a brine. And this brine would be able to stay liquid at Mars surface because of the salt that's in it. Um, so, you know, it's, it's kind of conjecture right now whether this, this could be actually be happening on Mars. Uh, but if it is, I mean, the implications for life forming there uh, is affected because, um, you know, microbes can, can live on things like perchlorates and that kind of thing. So, and then the other cool thing is that, um, uh, you know, if this was prevalent in Mars soil, it could be used by uh, for future human explorers, and they could use it as rocket fuel for generating oxygen. So, kind of neat. And and uh, you might remember, you know, you know, if there's any doubt that there's water droplets or water vapor in the air, you might remember that there was an image from Phoenix of um, water vapor or water droplets that looked like it was on Phoenix's lander legs. So, you know, it's it's pretty intriguing. So where do they think all this salt would have come from? Well, uh, in Antarctica or Mars? Well, I mean, in Antarctica, I, I guess that's the question, right? I mean, in both cases, well, I think I mean, it's. If you've got, I mean, I, I'm thinking ocean, right? That's all. I'm thinking ancient ocean is sort of is the possibility of where large amounts of salt would get mixed into the soil. Right. Uh, there, that area is um, is possibly could have been an ancient ocean. The other thing is that there's kind of little uh, fjords there, which uh, probably in the past, if it was warmer there, the, the, the sea spray could have um, come up onto the soil. Um, but uh, it seems to be inherent in the, in the, anywhere there's some water around there, you know, like around streams and under glaciers. 
Right, but what about in, on Mars then? Well, uh, yeah, was there an ancient, ancient ocean on Mars? Uh, you know, there's been some indications that kind of point to that. We've never, we've not seen anything conclusive yet, um, you know, but there are lots of scientists who do think that there was an ancient ocean on the Mars northern hemisphere. Yeah, I actually think that uh, Emily talked about that a couple of, uh, couple of shows ago, so yeah. uh, that's really exciting. Um, okay, so Nicole, you've got a story uh, this week about the way people can do work on SETI live. Yeah, so, you know, you're, skipping you're over the... Sk oh. oh, am I back? Skipping over the... the no, you're good, you're good. Okay, <laughs> skipping over the problem of whether or not a planet's actually Earth-like or there are microbes, let's skip all the way ahead to, you know, intelligent communicating beings, right? So SETI is the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, and they're looking for um, any kind of, you know, radio signal out in the cosmos, something coming from, you know, our galaxy that is uh, unusual, something that is coming from some intelligent source. And they're using the Allen Telescope Array, which, uh, if you remember a few months ago, um, started back up again after it lost funding, and then people, a whole bunch of people chipped in, including some celebrities. I know Jody Foster was was big on that campaign um, to f to fund the SETI efforts again for um, the Allen Telescope Array, which is out in Hat Creek, California. Um, so they have set up since. Uh, you know, you can have machines look for these things, um, these signals, but you can also have people chip in and uh, search through the data, look for signals and identify them. And let me see if I can try screen share. Oh, it, uh, Nancy's already screen sharing, so don't worry about oh, it. Oh, well, I have a couple of things I wanted to show. I wouldn't. Um, I wouldn't. I would, I would uh, because it can drop you out. It can sort of make you hang while you're talking. Oh. Our experience shows that, that screen sharing is sort of very server intensive, very computer gotcha. intensive. So, okay, so if well, you want, throw, throw them into the chat and then Nancy can bring up those, those in her screen. Sure. Well, okay. So if she's already signed up for it, then yeah. that will work. If not, then... Oh, I see. Work. Okay. Well, you can, give it a, yeah. you can give it a crack. I would just talk through it. I wouldn't worry about it. Okay. Um, so, I, I, so I spent a little bit of time playing with it, you know, for, for journalistic purposes, of course, um, with, with the SETI Live uh, setup. And uh, what they have is you, you see a screen. <laughs> here's my here's my thing of doing it. You see a screen with some kind of uh, signals on it. And one of my complaints about the, the early stages of this is that they don't quite label the axes. They don't, you know, it's not clear what you're seeing is is, is frequency, like a radio dial on the bottom, and um, time on the other axis. And so they're showing you this this signal and time, and you you point out uh, if there's a signal there. Um, so what you might see is a diagonal line coming, cutting across, which is usually a satellite that's going overhead, and that's what their tutorial shows. Um, I, I, oh, there, there it is. And so, um, and it shows, and it shows you information about uh, what actually um, the targets are selected from Kepler planet candidates, and so it shows you what the you know planet size-wise uh, should look like. Tells a little bit about the system. Um, they have a whole about section, which I, I highly recommend reading that before jumping in because it tells you what you're looking at, what, this, you know, what a satellite signal looks like, what a, a terrestrial signal looks like, um, some other weird thing like a spinning satellite does something you know, cool acro across the plot um, and, and shows you how it works and, and teaches you some of the about behind the scenes stuff. Um, but so this just launched what is this, today or yesterday. There's a, a handful of users on it already. Um, it's connected to Zooniverse projects, so if you're already set up um, with one of the, the, the Galaxy Zoo pro type projects, um, your login will work here as well, and you can go through and, and start classifying signals. And I think this, we talked about this uh, again a few shows ago, that now that uh, Kepler is discovering Earth-like worlds, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. but, but you know, potential candidates for for extraterrestrial life, then it's just a really natural fit to then match that up with SETI and have the folks from SETI examine these worlds and try to detect signals. It, it you know, turns the, the needle in a haystack problem yeah. way down. Right. Yeah, SETI, SETI's been going for 51 years now since uh, Frank Drake did his first experiment out in, in uh, Green Bank, West Virginia. And never before have they had, you know, these specific targets of these maybe Earth-sized planets um, that we can look at. They've just been picking, well, oh, let's look at some, like, stars. Let's look at, you know, M dwarfs. Let's look at, 
um, different type, you know, they, the needle in the haystack problem, like you said, is a big deal. They've been looking for as long, basically as long as we've had radio telescopes um, in, in case that there is a, a big beacon out there. Um, but this is going to help narrow the search quite a bit as if we know where these planets are um, to actually uh, point the ATA, the Allen Telescope Array, at them. Yeah, and I think this is this is getting at the same challenge both times. In in the case of what we talked about with Ian, with the, the terrestrial planet finder, one way to search for life is to analyze the atmosphere of the planets themselves. And if you see free oxygen in the atmosphere of that planet, it guarantees that there has to be some process like life that's creating it. I mean, really, there's no other explanation. If you see atmosphere in the in the atmosphere of a, of a distant planet life is creating it because oxygen is just so reactive it wouldn't last in the atmosphere for any length of time. So that's one way. And then, of course, SETI is the other way, which is that you just scan these worlds, look for signals, and determine if there's, if there's life there. Two really useful ways to go about it. And I think that I'm hoping that, and with, our, with your help, uh, we can put pressure on the various funding agencies to really you know, take this stuff really seriously because this is going to answer the most fundamental question, I think, in human science, you know, you know, are we alone in the universe? It's a, it's yeah. really important. So I, and, and it's like within our lifetime, and this again is no longer science fiction, we can get to the bottom of this. And if, if I was running NASA, um, I would overnight focus on those, those two things. I mean, they're the most fundamental questions I think you would, you can imagine. So, uh, that's really cool. Big SETI program and a terrestrial planet finder. Let's find some life. <laughs> All right. Well, why don't we kick back around then? And Ian, you've got another story about uh, about Hayabusa. Yeah, I have. Um, pretty exciting. I just had a quick comment for oh, um, sure. for, for Nichols, um, uh, the the SETI uh, SETI program, um, because SETI at home, of course, that was like one of the first distributed computing programs out there. But this is different because it's got the human influence rather than just letting your computer do all the work. You, you get you know, people on board, and of course the human brain is far more sophisticated than any computer algorithm, so you were able to see these patterns. Um, but I was kind of, when I saw the press release yesterday, I was thinking, well, you know, with the Zooners, um systems, you know, the Planet Hunters and, um, and you know, G Galaxy Zoo and all this, you're actually looking at something that you know exists, whereas this new SETI program is something, it's a different tact because you're looking for a highly speculative thing. You know, you don't know if you're going to find anything. And I just, I just wonder how popular it's going to be. I mean, which has got the alien factor before alien life. Very exciting. Um, but I'm just wondering how popular it will be compared to, you know, looking for exoplanets that we know exist. So, you know, everybody's running to find their first exoplanets. And in fact, there was a publication only a few weeks ago, wasn't there, about, um, you know, the, the first volunteer, volunteers who actually discovered the first exoplanets. I just wondered, you know, it's a second question. I just wondered, you know, what's your views on perhaps the popularity of this new SETI program? I mean, will that be, will it be as popular as the others, or do you think it would be more popular, or perhaps it won't take off at all? I don't know. Yeah, I guess um, the alien factor is probably a bigger factor than we, re we realize. I mean, that was what drove a lot of the SETI at home. Even though SETI at home didn't have an interactive feature, everyone made that their screensaver, um, you know, for, for a while because that was, you know, oh, I'm looking for aliens. Um, I think it's, it's more representative of, of how science works on the edge is that you don't know what you're looking for. And so it's a lot, uh, it, it, you know, it's a lot more speculative. You kind of don't know what you're doing. I feel like that's maybe I'm just saying this because I'm trying to write my thesis. But it's <laughs> that that feeling of not knowing what's going on and and pushing further and further ahead. So it does. Um, I think it does model that more accurately, and so it'll be interesting to see if that's just as popular. Well, as as a radio astronomer, Nicole, would you say that that there's any value to having regular folks looking at radio signals? I mean, is there something here that that a human would see that a computer wouldn't see? And yeah, it's, it's, I mean, even like finding pulsars and strange, I mean, I can imagine non-SETI forms of radio mm -hmm. transmissions. I mean, would that mm -hmm. be of any use? Yeah, there's a big um, unexplored space in time, the, the radio transients. We don't have these, you know, nightly, daily radio telescope surveys of the sky to look for, um, or, or we're just starting to get into that era where we have telescopes that are looking at the sky every day. Um, 
looking for transient phenomena. So this could be a, a pu weird pulsar or a radio burst from some unknown mechanism. Um, and I think that we're starting to build software that can look for them, but we're at the point where you know a human eye looking through it and searching through it. So these big telescopes that are that are being built, um, like like LOFAR um, in, in the Netherlands and Europe. Um, are are looking at the whole sky and surveying the whole sky, and so it's not just the you know alien signal will be awesome, but there are lots of natural phenomena that give off radio transients that um, we're just at the cusp of of really discovering and classifying. Cool. All right, so Ian, why don't you bring us up to speed on your asteroid story? Yeah, um, kind of exciting news this week um, because back in uh, in in 2010, um, yeah almost two years ago now, uh, the Hayabusa, the Japanese Hayabusa sample return mission to an asteroid um, re-entered the atmosphere over the Australian outback. Now, this signified the end of uh, what I would consider probably one of the most successful missions ever. <laughs> because the Apollo 13 of robotic spacecraft. Yeah, and even, there's even a movie, there's even a movie, a Japanese movie is has been made of this little robot Imagine Wally, but with uh, Tom Hanks' character. I mean, yeah. it's, it's just uh, with everything going wrong. Everything went wrong. I mean, literally, even even at the starting gate in 2003, when this thing was launched, it was going to be sent on its way to the asteroid Itakawa, and it was going to land on it, grab a sample of um, of surface, just a surface sample off the, off the asteroid. It would be the first ever mission to do so, and bring this sample back to Earth. That was its mission. Very ambitious, anyway but it could be done. And the Japanese space agency put this mission together, they launched it. In 2003, literally, it had just been launched. It got hit by massive solar flare, which I think knocked out some of its um, uh, solar panels. So it, it was already off to a bad start. And eventually, when it did get to the asteroid, I mean, there's so many other smaller issues. There, there was like issues with um, communications with the satellite, uh, with, the, with the space probe. Eventually, it, rendezvous with the asteroid and it actually crashed into the surface of the asteroid and bounced off. It was also um, commanded accidentally to come back to a safe distance. It was, they lost communication for a long time. It spun out of control. This thing saw everything. And even when it got, to, actually it was amazing it actually got to the asteroid. When it got to the asteroid and actually touched the surface of the asteroid, the bolt failed to fire inside the sample return system. Because basically it was going to put a, like a, a vacuum cleaner, if you like, a little hose over the, over the surface of the, um, the asteroid. And it was going to fire a projectile into the surface to kick up the surface sample. The bolt didn't fire. So basically it just came down, docked with the asteroid and kind of bumped around a bit didn't do that well, and it backed off, and then the they, they Japanese mission control went, oh, it didn't fire. And they were devastated, because you know the mission was coming back, it was already behind schedule, because it was limping through space, its ion drive wasn't receiving enough power from its uh, solar panels. So basically, it wasn't a very lucky mission. But they got back in, in 2010, everything went to plan. <laughs> it came back to Earth, it released the sample return capsule because there was a glimmer of hope that perhaps a little bit of dust may have floated into the into the sample return capsule, but there was no guarantee. But as it came back, the main spaceship disintegrated over the Australian outback, and it was brilliant because NASA had a, an aircraft, and they were able to actually film the thing coming through the atmosphere, and it released that capsule, and the capsule parachuted to where and it was returned. So the big question was, did it contain any dust? It did. It had like 1,500 grains of dust inside sample return capsule. So since they've discovered that and they, they've started doing that analysis on these uh, these grains, there's been a, a, quite a few publications, I believe, on what discovered. But this week was a big release of news from one of the universities in Japan, and they've basically done uh, microanalysis of these grains from the surface of, a, of the asteroid. And they found an amazing zoo of data. But just by zooming in on one of these little grains, they found that there are tiny impacts. And these impacts are caused by nanoscale micrometeorites. Well, nanometeorites. <laughs> They've basically impacted the surface and on the tiniest of scales produced these tiny craters. 
there's also little bits of glass that are fused to these tiny grains. And we're, look, we're talking about um, a scale of a world which is smaller than a human hair, the width of a human hair. So these are very, very tiny grains that got kicked off of this asteroid. And they're, they're noticing on the very smallest of scales the fundamental building blocks of Thank planets you. because asteroids are... The considered to be the uh, assuming our theory is the correct, of course, our theory is always getting turned over, but this is a strong theory that you know, from the, um, the nebula that formed all the planets around our, our sun, they all came together by little grains forming, attaching to each other, and then eventually they get bigger and bigger and bigger. They form um, asteroids, and you know, then gravity takes over, and then eventually they form protoplanets, and then bigger planets, which are gravit gravit gravitationally dominant, dominated. And then you get even bigger planets that are able to hold on to atmospheres like the Earth. So it's very important if we understand, to understand these asteroids because they form the, the seed of planets. And so they are looking on this microscopic scale at these tiny impacts from these tiny micrometeorites that are gradually forming and actually affecting the smallest scale of asteroids. And far from these asteroids being very peaceful, serene, cold, dead objects, it turns out they are bathed, they are constantly being weathered by space, by these high energy impacts. And these, these micrometeorites are flying very fast. They may be very, very small, but they're traveling at like 30,000 miles an hour. I mean, these things are bulleting through space. And it looks like asteroids are constantly being hit by these eroding micrometeorites. So extremely exciting. And if you have a look at some of the, some of the reports, where I did um, a blog post on it on Discovery News, just have a look at these micro impacts. You suddenly realize just how scary space is because these are invisible <laughs> threats. And these things will erode your spaceship. So be careful out there. <laughs> and, and so I guess one of the ideas about this is that you've got not only a, a, a low speed accretion by mutual gravity of these particles coming together, but actually these, this high speed accretion where you've got grains that are just being slammed at high speed, but they're absorbing some of these particles and fusing into larger and larger objects. So it's a, it's a pretty neat way that another sort of interesting way you can imagine how the early solar system came together. Yeah. Violently, and, uh, right? At high speed. Yeah. Yeah, and all this information comes from the most unlucky spacecraft in history. <laughs> yeah, it really does. That's, that's amazing. Great. I had no idea they were, they were going to make a Japanese movie. That's awesome. It should, I'll totally watch that. That sounds great. All right, so Nancy, we've got one last story, and, uh, and this is way out into the uh, speculative, uh, which is a... We just posted this on, on Universe Today uh, yesterday, thanks to Jason Major. I tried to get him to join <laughs> us, but he's, uh, he's in the air right now. Uh, which is that um, warp drives have a very big downside. Yeah. You want to talk about that? Sure. Uh, if, uh, if you haven't heard of the Alcubierre warp drive, which is a, kind of a theory of uh, how, how you can actually you know, go faster than the speed of light, and uh, it comes from a uh, theoretical physicist, Miguel Alcubierre, and what happens is, what he proposed is that you could actually create a bubble of, of, um, of energy around your ship, your spaceship, and um, it would, as it moved through space, it would um, compress the space in front of it, and then um, you'd be able to, and, and in doing so, you'd be able to go, um, you know, faster than the speed of light. I mean, this is um, essentially anyway. what they're doing in Star Trek, right? They're, they're, ex they're, yeah. com they're compressing the space in front. They're expanding the space behind. You can't move faster than the speed of light, but space can be moved faster than the speed of light, and that's how you can kind of get a workaround. Right. And, and, and people kind of like this, uh, this theory because it, it really, as Jason said, it plays well with, uh, with the current laws of physics as we understand it. Um, but anyway, there was some uh, researchers at the University of Sydney that kind of looked at this a little bit closer. And in creating this bubble, uh, you'd be moving through space and, and actually changing space and time. But anyway, it would collect all sorts of particles and energy. And as you came out of warp drive, what would happen is that there would be these, this huge explosion of uh, of negative particles and you basically what Jason said is that uh, you'd obliterate the person you're going to go visit and <laughs> right right so you would be for understand from his article you would be 
you be siphoning up all these particles that are that that get caught into your warp bubble, and then you would be accelerating them with you. So you'd actually be adding energy to these particles. And the, the further the distance you go, the more energy you put into them, the more lethal they become when you pop back out of warp. And so, right. you know, the moment you, you came out of warp, you would release this blast of energy at whatever was in front of you. So you'd get a nice yeah. quick trip, but there'd be nobody waiting for you once you got there. <laughs> but I think, you know, I mean, you know, we were sort of uh, over-sensationalizing the, the story. I mean, the, the reality is, you know, it's, it's a very directed beam, so you just wouldn't aim at the world that you were trying to get to, right? Hopefully right, yeah. Uh, nobody's they they mentioned you can... Right, they mentioned that you could aim your bubble just off to the left or right of, of your destination, and uh, hopefully nothing else would be in the path and, and get blasted into oblivion. But you can imagine this would be a very cool plot device for Star Trek, you know, where they, they need to, their, their weapons are down and they need to uh, destroy the enemy ship and Scotty uh, uh, has, they have Scotty pull the ship out of warp, you know, mere feet away from their, uh, from their target and destroy it with this lethal pulse of radiation <laughs> and, and particles. So, so, so the Star Trek writers, if you're listening, this, this one's for you. So that's, yeah. that's really cool. But you should check out the story. It's really cool. Um, Jason did a really good job with that one. That's on back on Universe today. Cool. All right. Well, let's um, let's wrap this up then. We'll we'll go and look and see if anyone has any questions for us. So, if you want to ask us any questions, I'll look through the uh, the questions that have already shown up so far <coughs> on the uh, the Google Plus. You can also ask questions on Twitter using the hashtag pound CQX pound Hangouts, or you can ask any questions you want in the in the actual Google Plus post. It's the one that ends in Wumza. Which is the that's the URL at the top. It says VJ7CHQ Wumza. Wumza. So so if you want to post a question there, we'll we'll try and get cracking on it. Um, also also plus one. Yeah, you know, yeah, that's right. Yes, and if you're watching this, the only way that we know that you're watching this is if you plus one it, and then we can sort of know that that we're that there's anyone out there apart from the comments and the shares. Uh, so if anyone has any questions, go ahead and type them in there. Uh, we will try and get the, going through them, not just. Uh, you know, questions based on what we've talked about today, but if you have any other questions or comments about uh, space astronomy, we'll, we'll go through them. So um, I will get going through the... Uh, um. So uh, Jacob uh, Steen Madsen asks, hasn't the resilience of life shown that uh, we can't expect to limit the condition demands? Once it's up and running in rather harsh environments, it can support life. I think it's a really good point that, that we're finding life here on Earth in you know, black smokers at the bottom of the ocean, in underground mines, in temperatures that would melt lead, um, in the atmosphere, in ice cold, all kinds of places. So, so can you see, I mean, on the one hand, we're, you know, we're defining it as Earth-like, but that's not really being really fair to how powerful and, uh, you know, how much life can, can spread into almost every different environment. I don't know, Ian, did you want to? respond to that. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is one question that you can guarantee you write anything about alien life and you will get the first comments saying, ah, but life as we know it, life you know, know better it. people. And, and it's like, yeah, well, there's probably a lot of life we don't know, but the point is we don't know it. So <laughs> the, only, the only precedent we got for life is here. It's, it's us. It's the stuff we know of and understand. And it all seems to come from one, one common genesis, if you like, I mean, to get you know, it's just one tree of life. There may be other trees, who knows? But we just don't know what those other trees are. But to then to say, okay, well, we're going to look for really awesome, weird kind of life. I, I could come up off the off the bat. I could say, oh yeah, there's probably there's life that could really enjoy living in the corona of a star. You know, make it its energy requirement from from the corona. I mean, of course, we know that Earth life can't live there. But that's not to say that there is no weird kind of plasma life that really likes living there. I mean, we're talking about Star Trek aliens here. Yeah. We can come up with weird kinds of aliens, but it doesn't mean they exist, but we need to be open to the, to the possibility. But the, the, the starting place to find life will be Earth-like planets, because that's the only life we know and understand. So we can't go off looking for weird life, because we don't even know if there is any other life apart from us. We are the only source of life that we know so far. 
Right, but but I guess the common the common thread in all the life we have here on Earth is liquid water. That liquid water acts as this as the sort of solution that all of the chemicals get mixed up around in, and so the common thread across all those things the the stuff we find under the ice, the stuff we find in these hot vents is all, there's always liquid water present acting as a solvent for the chemicals that are that are mixing together. For, for life here on Earth. Now, there's been research that there could be other kinds of solvents used, so you don't need, need to necessarily have water. You could have liquid methane, or maybe you could have um, liquid ammonia or something like that that could act as this solvent where the chemicals could mix together. But, but again, that's, as you say, right, taking it to the next complexity, which is that we don't even know what that would even look like. So it, it maybe if, if, if scientists can cook some of that up in the lab, then we can start to get an idea of what the, the signatures of that kind of life might look for. But, but, I mean, plasma creatures, silicon creatures, who knows what that would look like, right? How could we even detect it? They could be talking to us with their great balls of fire right now, right? The sun that is could be. life. Multi-dimensional creatures. Multi-dimensional creatures, creatures, yeah. Oh. Crystalline entities. Yeah. Crystalline yeah. entities, yeah. creatures that exist is in only, you know, terms of thought. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that's it. I mean, it's, you look for water. That's all we got, is look for liquid water. And that's what Earth-like in this case really means is we're hoping for liquid water. Um... So Scott Lewis asks, wouldn't finding an atmosphere quite similar to Earth be extremely indicative of having carbon-based life on it, since the oxygen in our atmosphere is a result of the life of Earth? Well, I... Yeah, I think you touched on that earlier, yeah. didn't you? So that's a, like, yeah, so, so essentially, right, that if you see oxygen, then, then you have to be life. I don't know if you could have a non-carbon-based... And it, it could still be some weird chemistry we don't know of that's not really life, I think. Um, it, has to be, it has to be replenished by some process. And there aren't natural know. processes that can replenish oxygen to that scale. I don't know if there are. Yeah, or that's, you know, all the scientists I've talked to are serious about this say no. Like yeah. you, 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 you can have volcanoes producing carbon dioxide, right. and you can have other processes that can produce methane, but oxygen is just too... Um, reactive to be to be shown for any other reason so mm -hmm. um. <laughs> but so if so plant life I mean plant life would be a possibility then mm hmm yeah absolutely yeah um, let's see uh, it, oh Beth Johnson wants to know speaking of SETI is anyone going to be attending SETI con this summer in the San Francisco Bay Area anyone you going Nicole I have not planned anything beyond May. <laughs> right. So if anyone's watching, there's something called SETICON this summer in San Francisco, so check yeah. that out. I would love to. I would love to. That'd be fun. Um, let's see if there are any more questions here. So, uh, Terramancy... Leon Lyon uh, says there's several uh, other projects out there on on a system called Boink B O I N C. I don't know what that stands for, but it's a way to let you use your computer time for for mm. scientific projects. And so there's Einstein at home, uh, Milky at home, Cosmology at home. There's Folding at home. So there's a bunch of uh, a bunch of projects you can get involved in to contribute your computer time. I do think you're a bit a bit right in that that just you know installing one program and letting your computer just crunch through someone's scientific data for them is a lot easier and less time intensive than to actually sit down and <clears throat> and search for stuff yourself. But I you know, yeah. we've seen people really get excited on a lot of you know, Galaxy Zoo and a lot of projects like that and what we're doing with Yeah, that's the thing. I mean who ones. didn't who didn't have like SETI as um, as Nicole said, uh, who who didn't have SETI at home at some point on their computer and you just love seeing the graphics, you know, flashing along and you just thought you were doing something. And then now back in the States I've got my PC who which is turned on for no reason apart from that I know that SETI at home is churning away in the background. Um <laughs> So, you know, I, I kind of geek out when I think about that, and I, and I just think it's just a very small comp small cog in a very big machine of the search for um, extraterrestrial life. And I, I was just, I love the fact that SETI have gone, okay, well, we want to take this very impersonal search from the computer to the human eye, because that, that's, that could really engage the public. So from for a public outreach point of view, I think it's gold. But mm -hmm. I just wonder whether, you know, the fact that, 
you're probably not going to see, well, <laughs> if you do, it'll be a historic event. But if right. you did see that signal, it'd be like fighting, you know, winning the lottery. Um, but, but you're not just looking at, I, I mean, there, there's satellites and yeah. other stuff. So yeah, you're not just looking, looking at static, because that would suck, obviously. Um, yeah. So there's something exactly. to look at. Just label your axes. It's my only thing. Label your axes. <laughs> Also, um, if we're talking about citizen science, I mean, CosmoQuest, that's one of its, its main yes. drivers, is uh, there's a moon, the moon Mappers project up now where you can classify um, craters and, and, and all kinds of uh, features on the surface of the moon. And a couple of others, uh, I think we'll have Asteroid Vesta. Um, there's a uh, tie-in to New Horizons. And um, yeah, we're hoping to bring some more uh, astronomy projects in as well. Just yeah, look with yeah. Your eyes. I mean, this this very hangout is actually a uh, what you're watching right now is really sort of overseen by or produced by the work that we're doing with CosmoQuest. So this is, you know, it's me and and especially Pamela is really spearheading all of this. Is really a desire to try and connect out with the public and do outreach and get everybody involved in in participating in space and astronomy research and really trying to connect the working scientists with the general public that, that's enthusiastic and has time and skill and knowledge and, and ability. And we really feel that, <clears throat> that, that 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 vast number of people that have a real enthusiasm for this, you know, we, ha we haven't really tapped that potential to get all those people mm -hmm. involved and, and really help them participate in, in science. It's so weird, you know. You, you get these situations, like you feel like a matchmaker. You know, on the one hand, you've got researchers like, God, oh, it's so hard to do all this work and there's never enough hands and, you know, I, I wish there was all these projects I could work on, but we never have enough resources. And then on the other hand, you've got millions of people who are, who are all saying, I really wish I could get involved. I'm so I'm excited about these sci the scientific research. I really wish there were more discoveries and I wish there was a way I could play a part and there really is. So that's what we're doing with CosmoQuest and so over the next years we're going to try and get, you know, teach people more and more about how to do some of this research, get people involved in projects and raise, you know, raise the level of, of science. It's really exciting. I think this is one of the really neat things about the internet is to, is to help get people involved in science. So, and that's my way of saying I'm starting to not see very many new questions. So, um, uh, apparently, there's a concert in uh, at the Jodrell Bank uh, Observatory in. I just saw go that. Check that out. I've never been there. That's on my list of, of I, radio telescopes I want to visit. Have you done? Have you been to the Jodrell Bank, Ian? No, no. sadly, no. I, I rarely have the opportunity to leave my office these days. So <laughs> I mean, it's great. It's great working from home. I mean, the commute's five seconds, so I'm not going to complain. But you find yourself based more and more at home. So no. Sorry. But you're in. But you're in England right now. Oh, I, 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 I'll go tomorrow because Britain is that big. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just like Canada. Low. Yeah, it's just like Canada. radio telescopes are by nature inaccessible because they're in the middle of nowhere. Right. <laughs> Away from the Wi-Fi and the cell phone towers. Yeah, exactly. Kind of peaceful sometimes. Cool. All right. Well, thanks to everybody who who watched us this week, and thanks for uh, to all of our uh, all of our space journalists who showed up this week. We've got uh, thanks Ian, thanks Nancy, thanks Nicole. Uh, remember plus one this if you can. Uh, the next thing we're going to be doing t is tomorrow uh, on Friday at 10 a.m. We'll be having an interview uh, with Kepler scientists. Sorry, what was the name again, Nancy? Darren Regazine. Right. So we're going to be having the, the Kepler interview tomorrow at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, 1800 UTC. And then Sunday night, uh, we're going to be doing a virtual star party where we stream lots of telescopes into a hangout and you can watch and, and make requests. So that is so much fun. You need I to know. do it. It is super fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, we'll see everybody uh, next, next time. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.